as we finish up on Easter Sunday, we'll all head home and uh, celebrate our risen Lord. So let's just go ahead and get into our service for this evening. Let me give you a little bit of an introduction here of uh, what the Tenebrae service is all about. And it's recalling the seven last words of Christ. Tenebrae is a Latin word which means shadows. And has been observed in the church of Jesus Christ since the 4th century. On this Good Friday, we remember the death of Jesus and recall his seven last words on the cross. As we remember the last words, we will extinguish the candles on the altar one by one. The gradual extinguishing of the candles will be accompanied by prayers, hymns, and readings from Scripture. The Christ candle will be removed briefly from the sanctuary to signify Christ's death, but will be brought back as a foretaste of the resurrection that we will celebrate on Easter.
Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. <laughs> Yet we consider him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sing the hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane, verses 1 through 4, the Greek hymnal, number 109.
chapter 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Our first reading is from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 14. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with Hesa, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Almighty God, to whom your crucified Son prayed for the forgiveness of those who did not know what they were doing, grant that we too may be included in that prayer. Whether we sin out of ignorance or intention, be merciful to us and grant us your acceptance and peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our suffering Savior, Amen. Amen. Our next hymn is Jesus and Thy Dying Wolves. We'll just be singing the first two verses in the green hymnal, number 112. <laughs> Except 
through me. O Lord Jesus Christ, who promised to the repentant the joy of paradise, enable us by the Holy Spirit to repent and to receive your grace in this world and in the world to come. Amen. Amen. Seek me 
mocking. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Almighty God, who forsook your Son upon the cross, showing the world your judgment upon human sin and guilt, grant us, upon hearing his cry, the grace to know and believe that we will never be forsaken, that he is present with us even to the end of the age, for the sake of Jesus Christ, who bore our sins on the cross. Amen. Amen. Verses 7 and 8. Some more. 
Early on Friday morning, the religious leaders reach a decision to send Jesus to a governor, governor named Pilate. Now, Pilate is hesitant to do anything to Jesus. However, he gives in to the clamor of the crowd. The mob of people is agitated and starts to scream, Crucify him! Crucify him! Jesus is taken by the soldiers, stripped of his clothes, and tied to a wooden pole where he is beaten with a whip. Now the whip, this whip has jagged pieces of bone and lead tied to the ends of the cords which come crashing down on Jesus with every stroke. The soldiers take turns lashing his bare back with the whip, tearing into the flesh with every hit. Jesus is now bleeding profusely with multiple lacerations exposing muscles, ligaments, and blood vessels. One of the soldiers takes off his purple cloak and puts it over Jesus' shoulders. Another quickly puts a crown of sharp thorns to mimic the wreath that Caesar wore and jams it onto his head. These thorns are as sharp and as sturdy as spikes and blood runs freely down Jesus' head to mingle with the blood that already covers the rest of his body. And the soldiers aren't finished yet. Next, they place a reed in his right hand to look like a scepter, and even kneel down before him to mock him as a king. As they get up from their kneeling, they spit at him in his face. All this took place before 8 o'clock in the morning, on Friday morning. However, things are going to get much worse. It was customary to make a prisoner carry his own crossbar to the place of execution. However, since Jesus is so weak from the terrible beating, the soldiers grab someone out of the crowd to carry the 100-pound piece of timber almost a half mile to the place of execution site. It's a grim scene. Jesus is bloody and exhausted, as he stumbles along the rough cobblestone. They finally arrive at a place called Golgotha. The soldiers take off Jesus' clothes and offer him something to numb the pain, but he refuses. Jesus is fully conscious and aware as the, the Roman guards throw him to the ground and position him on the cross. A five to seven inch spike is nailed through each of his wrists. Jesus' feet are then crossed, and a spike is driven through them. The cross is raised by these four soldiers and positioned in the right place. The cow soldiers then sit down, indifferent to what was going on. They had seen all of this many, many times before. They even throw some dice to see who gets to keep Jesus' clothes. People walk by and hurl insults at Jesus to make fun of him when he hangs on the cross. The first R is the reality of Christ's death. Next, we'll take a look at the results of Christ's death, the second R. First, we looked at the reality of his death. Next, we'll look at the two results of Jesus' death. The Bible records two incidents that happened when Jesus died. The first incident is words from the cross that Jesus spoke. Jesus has been on the cross for about six hours now. The soldiers would have been assigned to keep watch. And just before Jesus dies, he cries out in John chapter 19, verse 30, It is finished! The Greek word used for finished is the word telestai. This is a term from the world of finance and banking. When someone would borrow some money and then pay it back, the, the banker would stamp the word telestai on the receipt to declare that the debt had been paid off. Literally, it means paid in full. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for us. Jesus took our liabilities and stamped it paid in full. Across the ledger, the ledger sheet of our life, our sin debt has been forgiven. 
because of our moral failures and patterns of sin, each of us deserves to be sentenced for our cosmic crimes against a holy God. In order for justice to be made for these sins against God, a price has to be paid. The Bible makes it clear that we either pay it or someone else needs to. You see, folks, each one of us has violated God's standards. Because he is a holy and just God, a penalty has to be paid. So God sent his son Jesus to be that payment for each one of us. Jesus died on the cross as our sin substitute. He paid the price with his life, and God accepted his death as full payment for all of our sins. Tastai. It is finished. So the first result is that we are acquitted and our debt has been paid in full. The Bible says that Jesus shouted this word telestai loudly right before he died. It was like a victory shout. Jesus' final cry from the cross was not a cry of despair. It was a cry of completion and fulfillment. And that is why he had come to this world. If his hands had not been nailed to the cross, Jesus would have thrust a triumphant fist into the air. And now Jesus takes his last and final breath. The second incident is the torn curtain in the temple. Matthew chapter 27 verse 51 tells us, at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I talked about this at our Wednesday service a couple of weeks ago, but for those who are not able to make it to the service, I'll explain again what happened when this curtain in the temple was torn in two. The temple is where people used to go to pray and offer animal sacrifices to God. There were different parts of the temple, and the most holy place was called the Holy of Holies. A thick curtain separated this inner sanctuary from the outer area. And this curtain was no mere shower curtain either. It was 60 feet long, 20 feet high, and 4 inches thick. It's recorded that it took over 300 priests just to install it. Only one person, the high priest, was allowed to even go into this area of the temple. And then only one time per year to offer a major sacrifice for his people on the Day of Atonement. The whole structure emphasized the remoteness of God and the difficulty of gaining access to him. When Jesus died, this ginormous curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that it was God himself who tore it in half. Now, Instead of just one person having access to God once a year, the way to God stands open, wide open to everyone, every day of the year. Result number one of Christ's death is our acquittal. Result number two is our open access to God. Everything has been paid in full. We have been declared free and forgiven. And now we have an open avenue to God in which we can access Him at any time. Friends, all of this is possible now because of the death of Jesus. So this brings us to our third R, which is the responses to Christ's death. We can see four different responses to the death of Jesus. These responses are evident in the various people who witnessed Jesus die that Friday afternoon. The first response is the scoffers. Luke chapter 23, verse 35, records that they said things like, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. This group was indignant. They wanted to give Jesus a hard time. Now this was their chance while he was hanging up on the cross. 
Peter wrote about this scene in the first book of Peter, chapter 2, verse 23, where he says, when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. These scoffers launched a verbal assault. They strung their bows with self-righteousness and launched stinging arrows of pure poison. And yet, and yet, with his body wracked with pain, his eyes blinded by his own blood, his lungs gasping for air, Jesus prays in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. If ever a person deserved a shot at revenge, Jesus did. But he didn't take a shot at the scoffers. Instead, he died for them. The second response is a group called the spectators. These people were attracted to the execution. Just like people who slow down to take a look at an accident when they are driving, this group of people was just content to watch. They were completely indifferent to what was going on, at least when they first came to the scene. Scripture says that as they watched, they began to drift away one by one. Luke chapter 23, verse 30, 48 says this, when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. When someone beat their breast in the first century, it was a sign of guilt and remorse. Their indifference had been replaced with feelings of guilt. As they watched what Jesus went through, maybe they began to realize their role in putting him on the cross. They came to witness a show, but they left with feelings of woe. The third response is from a group called the Seekers. First we had the scoffers, next we had the, the spectators, and this third group we'll call the Seekers. Not many people in group number three. In fact, we know from reading the different gospel accounts that really only two people fit in this category. One was a thief who was nailed to the cross next to Jesus. The other was the captain of the soldiers. He was called a centurion, meaning that he could be commanding up, up to 100 soldiers. The centurion witnessed the scourging, the mocking, the spitting, the crucifixion, the indignant scoffers, and the indifferent spectators. He heard everything that Jesus said on the cross, heard his last cry, and watched him die. And he was deeply impressed. He had never seen anything like this before. The centurion was moved and drawn to the Savior. He was intrigued by what he saw. You see, he started out viewing Jesus as just an ordinary criminal. However, he then watched and listened and investigated. And his closed mind started to open. And he began to seek, to question, and to wonder. As he processed everything, he changed his mind on, this, on the basis of this new evidence. The centurion then decided that Jesus was no ordinary criminal, but instead a triumphant hero. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verse 39, records the response of this battle-scarred soldier. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, heard his cry and saw how Jesus, he, how Jesus had died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Max Lucado wrote a book called Six Hours, One Friday. Listen to how he captures what may have been going on inside the centurion that afternoon. He was uneasy. 
He had been since noon. It wasn't the depths that troubled him. He'd mastered the art of numbing his heart. But this crucifixion plagued him. Half the crowd taunted and half cried. The soldiers griped. As the hours wore on, the centurion found himself looking more and more at the one on the center cross. He didn't know what to do with this man's silence or with his kindness. Suddenly, the center head ceased to bob. It yanked itself erect. Its eyes opened in a flash of white. A roar sliced the silence. It is finished. It wasn't a yell. It wasn't even a scream. It was a roar, like a lion's roar. He looked up into the face of the one near death. The king looked down at the crusty old centurion. Jesus' hands were fastened. They couldn't reach out. His feet were nailed to timber. They couldn't walk toward him. His head was heavy with pain. He could scarcely move it. But his eyes, they were a fire. They were unquenchable. They were the eyes of God. Perhaps that's what made the centurion say what he said. He had seen the eyes of God. Instead of being an indignant scoffer who walked away unchanged or an indifferent spectator who walked away with some guilt, the centurion was a seeker who was intrigued by Jesus. He hung around long enough to reach a conclusion about who Jesus was. And when he reached his conclusion, he wasn't afraid to shout it out. Jesus was the Son of God. This brings us to the fourth response, and that group is the saved. This fourth group was the friends and followers of Jesus. They were probably scared when they first got there, so they were watching from a distance. However, as time goes on, they came closer and closer to the cross. As they understood more and more what was happening, some of them realized that this was exactly what Jesus had predicted would take place. They began to see it clearly now. Jesus had to die in order for them to be acquitted from their sins. And Jesus had to die in order for them to have access to God the Father. So which group best describes where you're at in your spiritual journey this evening? Are you an indignant scoffer? Are you determined to launch a volley of attacks at the Savior? Do you have something against him? Or are you an indifferent spectator? Are you just kind of hanging around? Then when you feel some guilt, you just walk away. Maybe you're an intrigued seeker. Are you interested in Jesus? Do you find yourself drawn to him? Or are you in the group of the saved? Are you a follower of Jesus, but have grown distant from him? What will it take you to move closer to Jesus? That's really the question for each of us tonight. What will it take for us to move closer to Jesus? The centurion started out as a scoffer who became an indifferent spectator. And as he watched, he became an intrigued seeker. By his bold confession, he may have become a recipient of salvation that very afternoon. Folks, you can't, you can't be passive about this one. There's something about the crucifixion of Christ that made every witness either step toward the cross or move away from it. It compelled some and it repelled others. The scoffers and spectators walked away from the cross. The seekers and the, and the saved moved towards the cross, took a step closer. Jesus is dying to reach you. Actually, he died to reach you. 
Jesus is re reaching out his nail-scarred hands out to you. If you listen, you hear him calling your name. Friends, Jesus has done it all for you. Done it in full. Why don't you move one step closer to him right now? If you're a scoffer, why don't you take a step closer and become a spectator? If you're a spectator, why don't you take a step closer and become a seeker? And if you're a seeker, maybe it's time for you to become saved. If you're saved, it's time for you to come closer to Jesus and surrender your all to him. And that is why Good Friday is so very, very good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are in awe of your incredible love that is so great for us that you would send your one and only Son here to this world to be with us, to live with us, and to ultimately die for us. Thank you, Lord, for your gracious gift of love that if we only believe in that sacrificial act of your Son, he said, it is finished. That all of our sins are forgiven and we have the promise of eternal life with you in him. Thank you, Lord. And it is in the holy name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen.
fifth word from John chapter 19, verse 28. I am thirsty. Our reading is from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 5. Come, all you are who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest fare. Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. O blessed Savior, whose lips were dry and whose throat was parched, grant us the water of life, that we who thirst after righteousness may find it quenched by your love and mercy, leading us to bring this same relief to others. Amen. The sixth word, it is finished, from John chapter 19, verse 30. Our reading is from Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox. I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow and on the third day. On Till I, I reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not going. Look, your house is left to you desolate, I tell you, some will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. O oh, blessed Savior, whose lips were dry. Let me do that one. O oh, Lord Jesus Christ, who finished the work that you were sent to do, enable us by your Holy Spirit to be faithful to our call. Grant us strength to bear our crosses and endure our suffering even unto death. Enable us to live and love so faithfully that we also become good news to the world. Joining your witness, O Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. seventh word from Luke chapter 23 verse 46. Father into your hands I commend my spirit. Our reading is from Luke chapter 2 verses 29 through 35. Sovereign Lord as you have promised you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and raising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Father, in whose hands your Son, Jesus Christ, commanded his spirit, grant that we too follow his example. May in all of life and at the moment of our death, 
entrust our lives into your faithful hands of love. In the name of Jesus, who gave his life for us, Jesus, verses 1 through 5, in the green hymnal, number 1, 2, 3. 